Now you can start. In his book, I Call It Heresy, A.W. Tozier reveals his view of lordship salvation when he says this. True obedience is one of the toughest requirements of the Christian life. Apart from obedience, there can be no salvation. For salvation without obedience is a self-contradictory impossibility. We need to preach again a Christ who is, will be either Lord of all or he will not be Lord at all. In the same chapter, he further revealed his view of repentance in talking about the prodigal son of Luke 15. And hear me as I read what he said on that parable. The first thing the returning sinner does is to confess, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Thus, in repentance, we fully submit to the word of God and the will of God as obedient children. And if we do not give him that obedience, I have reason to wonder if we are really converted. Well, Tozier is not alone in thinking that repentance is an integral part of the salvation process or the justification process. Most of us, I'm sure, have read John MacArthur's classic line in the sand development of the gospel according to Jesus when he says in no uncertain terms from his first message to his last, the Savior's theme was calling sinners to repentance. And this meant not only that they gained a new perspective on who he was, but also that they turned from sin and self to follow him, end quote. But in my own seminary, a very popular writer these days is a fellow named Daryl Bach, and he says this, I quote, Repentance is an appropriate summary for the offer of the gospel today. And in his development of that particular thought, he says there are three things that are almost synonymous. Repentance, turning, and faith. And he tries to contrast the root with the fruit. But down in the root, he puts repentance, turning, and faith. He defines repentance as a new perspective turning as a new direction, and faith as a new focus. But all three are required for salvation. In summarizing some of what he's written, I have said in this discussion, it appears as though there is fruit within the root. One's direction in life, turning, is produced by the repentance, change of perspective. And both of these things, repentance and turning, occur before one believes an act which is still part of the root as defined by Bach. Hence, when the dust of these definitions has settled, one must both repent, get a new perspective, and turn, get a new life direction, before one can believe, get a new focus. Therefore, salvation for Daryl Bach equals repentance plus turning plus faith. Well, as you might realize, there are those who do not think that repentance is for unbelievers. John Calvin wrote, Now it ought to be a fact beyond controversy that repentance not only constantly follows faith, but it is born of faith. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, All the fruits meet for repentance are contained in faith itself. You shall never find that a man who trusts in Christ has faith, remains an enemy to God or a lover of sin. And so it is fair to say that some theologians teach that repentance is for unbelievers, while others teach that repentance is only for believers. Which view is right? Is repentance for unbelievers or is it for believers? I'm proposing in this study that repentance is for all men. Repentance is for unbelievers. Repentance is for believers. But repentance is not a condition for receiving eternal life. 
So what I'd like to do is to briefly bring you up to where we are by going back to about 100 A.D., briefly trace some of the thinkers on repentance up till today, a historical study, you can sleep through this if you like, then we want to look at the scriptures themselves, and I want to show you passages where repentance is for unbelievers. Then I want to show you passages where repentance is for believers. And finally, arrive at what I consider to be a fair definition of what repentance is. So first of all, the post-apostolic fathers going through Augustine. If we go back to the shepherd of Hermas, and Hermas claimed to be a contemporary of Clement, the Presbyterian bishop of Rome, 92 through 101, and Hermas died 140 A.D. He supposedly was instructed by the angel of repentance in his writing. He's calling a lackadaisical church to repent. But if you read the Shepherd of Hermas, you will find it's a thoroughly meritorious, legalistic system. He never mentions grace. He never mentions justification by faith. One earns his salvation as a matter of fact, he believed in atonement for sin through martyrdom. And he said this, water baptism is the seal of repentance, which makes Christians Christians. Asceticism and penal suffering are the school of conversion. And so faith is the fruit of repentance, and it is baptism that seals it. Following him by just two or three decades is Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr said something similar. Because what I want you to understand is that everyone up to Augustine saw water baptism as a work of man and the point of regeneration and the very work that was required by man to go to heaven. Justin Martyr said this, those who are convinced of the truth of our doctrine are exhorted to prayer, fasting, and repentance for past sins. Then they are led by us to a place where there is water. And in this way, they are regenerated, as we also have been regenerated. For Christ says, except you are born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. The importance of water baptism for Justin Martyr is underscored again by these words when he says, the labor of repentance is baptism, the only thing that is able to cleanse those who have repented. And so it's amazing how soon and how quickly people in Christendom had turned from the gospel which Paul had presented to them. Already, water baptism has become the key which opens the door to heaven. The Judaizing influence that Paul fought against so long and hard swept through like a tidal wave and sucked Christendom down under its toe. They considered baptism a good work, and repentance is the achievement by which one secures salvation and life. Penitence, weeping, wailing, these things could win God's forgiveness, according to Justin Martyr. And so even early in the second century, repentance becomes connected with winning God's acceptance, and repentance is intricately linked to water baptism. That was also true of Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, it was true of Irenaeus. And by the time we get to Augustine, water baptism is completely accepted by the Roman Catholic Church as that which opens the door to heaven. Now, one thing different, though, when we get to Augustine. All the way up to this time, water baptism has been viewed as a work of man, a meritorious thing he can do to gain his salvation. But in Augustine, who saw the order of salvation as, first of all, predestination, then call, then justification, and then glorification, for him, these things were all the gracious work of God not something that man could win on his own. And so he saw that being true of repentance as well. It was something that God wrought within the soul of the human being. But by the time of Augustine, a new problem had arisen. You see, up to that time, pretty much, up to 350 A.D., they didn't do infant baptism. 
And so the big issue was all of my sins up to the point of baptism. And then when I'm water baptized, all of these sins are forgiven up to the point of baptism. But what do I do with the sins after baptism? They didn't have a way to deal with that, and so some people would postpone their water baptism until their deathbed. They would wait to the very end, knowing that only then would all their sins be forgiven. Well, by the time of Augustine, infant baptism was in full force. Now what are they going to do with the sins of little babies who grow up 